the Constitution provides for a, uh, a division of labor in governing the country between Congress and the president and the courts. And there is a fundamental commitment in American political culture to this idea of division. It's a protection that uh, uh, by having this redundancy of, uh, of, of political opinion in the nation's capital, you, you, you have to have agreement between the House of Representatives and the Senate and then the presidency and then the court has to at least tacitly agree to something. That's a protection against individual liberty and, and that commitment to uh, division is deeply embedded in American political culture and, and just endures from generation to generation to generation. And yet we know that there are times in American political history when we've moved to a very different kind of governing environment in which the president has clearly been seen as the national leader. There is no provision in the American Constitution for any one leader in our political system. Normally it's done by compromise and consensus. And yet, in times of crisis, in times of, of, of system-threatening crisis, in, in times of major war, the American people have routinely looked to leadership uh, uh, out of the presidency. Again, there's no formal provision for this in the Constitution, as there are in some other democratic constitutions. If you look at the French Constitution, Article 14 provides that in a moment of crisis, as, uh, as, as decided by the nation's leadership, we'll go into an alternative way of governing in which the legislature takes a back seat. All right? There is not a provision, a formal provision for that in the, in, in the U.S. Constitution. You can find it in a constellation of provisions, but uh, there's not a formal emergency provision there. So what's happened is that behaviorally, Americans have tended to, uh, to behave differently in moments of crisis than they have in times of political normalcy. One of the best places to see this, of course, is in the, uh, in, in the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln comes in, the nation is basically falling apart. And uh, Lincoln understands that um, the realities of the moment require him to take action that under normal circumstances he could not get away with. He would be jailed for. And in fact, in, uh, as he is inaugurated in April of 1861, Lincoln effectively becomes the government of the United States. The South is seceding, the nation is falling apart, and what does Lincoln do? He essentially declares a state of emergency, and he invites Congress to come back and help him, but not immediately. He says, why don't you come back, I believe on the 4th of July, and we'll work this out. But he gives himself 13 weeks of freedom from having to deal with members of Congress, during which time Abraham Lincoln is effectively the government of the United States of America. And he does all kinds of extraordinary things that would otherwise, under normal times, get him impeached and thrown out of office. He raises taxes. He calls in an army. He, uh, he intrudes on, uh, on individual liberties, closes down newspapers, and so forth. He does all of this, which is constitutionally unprecedented. You can't imagine, if you look back to the way that the presidency had operated in the 1830s and 1840s and 1850s, there is not a hint of this kind of power in the presidency. And yet when Lincoln is confronted with the crisis of the Union, he believes that he's empowered by the laws of necessity and by provisions that he can find in the Constitution, such as the oath of office. I have the oath, I take an oath before God to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. And this includes the nation itself, which importantly for Lincoln predates the Constitution. Four score and seven years ago doesn't take you back to Philadelphia in 1787, does it? No, it takes you back to the Declaration of Independence, which was critical for Lincoln. So the nation precedes the Constitution. He sees it as his role to preserve and save that Constitution. And importantly, not only does he believe it, but the rest of the government believes it as well. Congress does come back, and one of the first things Congress does is it basically ratifies everything that he had done up until that point in time. They're, they're not terribly happy about it. They'd like to be consulted, but they understand that the necessity requires 
a government to be able to deal with this kind of threat and that the energy in the executive that Hamilton talks about is at, a, at, at its maximum in, in a time of crisis. So Lincoln does this. And throughout the course of the Civil War, although he doesn't exercise quite the level of authority that he does in those first 13 weeks, it's very close to it. Congress nibbles at his heels a little bit around the edges, but for the most part, they give Lincoln the latitude that he needs in order to preserve the Union. Consider, for example, the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln could have gone to Congress to do this, but what does he do? No, he does it by executive order. By the stroke of a pen, Lincoln engages in what the historians Charles and Mary Beard once termed the most stupendous act of sequestration in the history of Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence. What did Lincoln do? By the terms of the day, and I want to be careful about this, by the terms of that time, he, by the stroke of a pen, took the property of millions of Americans. Again, something that you can't imagine he has the authority for under the Constitution, except under this general rubric or notion of a war power, which doesn't exist, again, formally any place in the Constitution, but exists only in a kind of loosely constructed constellation of powers that, um, that the American public and Congress agrees to. But in the process, there were also serious precedents that were set surrounding presidential power. For the first time, a president suspended habeas corpus, um, imprisoning an entire state legislature, imprisoning journalists. Uh, it was a, a moment in history where there was no guidebook. There had been civil wars in the past, but never in the United States. It was one in which there was a serious civil war occurring in a structured, institutionalized, constitutional republic. And, and that sets up clear barriers of power around governing institutions, around the presidency, around Congress, around the judiciary. But in a time of crisis, uh, people look the other way. Rules are relaxed. Rules are just thrown away. And in many ways, while President Lincoln executed a war, prosecuted a war that ultimately held the republic together, it also taught the nation a lesson about the magnitude of presidential power and the importance of checks and balances, even in a time of crisis. So Lincoln is the best example of, that, that, uh, 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 of the existence of a crisis presidency. The same thing happens, though, in World War I. Woodrow Wilson is so powerful during World War I, that he, through his operatives, can tell you as an American how much sugar you can put in your morning coffee, all right, uh, is responsible for a massive state apparatus that had developed between the Civil War and uh, World War I to construct a war machine and then to deploy it overseas. Something similar happens during the first 100 days of the Franklin Roosevelt presidency in 1933 to combat the Great Depression. Bills were rushed through Congress practically overnight to do things that he felt was needed to be done. Again, in ways that it's hard to, to imagine um, uh, if, if you had been schooled in American politics from 1800 to 1861, for example. And uh, the same thing happens again in, uh, during the course of World War II, that, uh, uh, that Franklin Roosevelt had given him enormous power, including the intrusion on civil liberties. It's very controversial later on that he rounds up uh, Japanese Americans and puts them in internment camps, but it's just an adjunct of a crisis presidency that Americans allow all of their civil liberties uh, uh, to be uh, much more thoroughly intruded on by uh, a president than before. One of the things that happens during a period of crisis is that the other political institutions understand that they have to accept presidential leadership in a way that they routinely would not. I mean, under normal circumstances, there is this notion of compromise and consensus where they will go back and forth and agree on policy. The very definition of a crisis suggests that things can't wait for this time-consuming process to take place and that the very pr uh, uh, procedures necessary to reach compromise and consensus are, are, are time-consuming and can't be allowed to, to carry on. And so what you tend to find is that 
Congress, the courts, the American people, the press even, all recognize that because of the realities of the circumstances, they have to be willing to subject themselves to presidential direction in a way that is uncommon under normal circumstances. In times of crisis, uh, the Korematsu decision by, by the U.S. Supreme Court and the actual action taken by President Roosevelt to intern uh, Japanese Americans or Japanese immigrants uh, shows that during crisis, Americans are willing to give their president substantial power and that there needs to be institutional processes that can push back against that. Firm processes in American government that can uphold American values, American expectations, and American law, even in the face of widespread public support that would authorize a president or a Congress or a judiciary to violate that law, to violate the Constitution. The American system is an imperfect one, and there are ways in which violations can occur. But what episodes like the Japanese internment and the Korematsu decision show us is the importance of always being weary, of always questioning what, uh, what decisions are being made by leadership uh, and whether they're violating American values.